We're going to be looking at the legal requirements of marriage, and for this, the key piece of legislation is going to be uh, the Marriage Act. But before we get to the Marriage Act, we need to see where the original definition of marriage came from. It actually came from common law, from a precedent set in Hyde and Hyde and Woodmancy in 1866. Lord Penzance, and that was the actual name of the judge, found that marriage was, quote, the voluntary union for life of one man and one woman to the exclusion of all others. That's a really important definition. Uh, the voluntary union for life of one man and one woman to the exclusion of all others. There are four key elements to that, and we're going to come back to that in a moment. Now, in Australia, Section 51 of the Constitution gives the Commonwealth the power to make laws about marriage and divorce, and that means that they've passed the Marriage Act 1961, and that defined marriage as the union of a man and a woman to the exclusion of all others, voluntarily entered into for life. Now, if that sounds familiar, that's because it's pretty much the same definition that we had in 1866. Had a question? Um, is he called Lord Pendance because that was the House of Lords? Um, he would have been... I think he was from the Privy Council. He might not have been, though. If he was in the Privy Council, he would have been also a member of the House of Lords, so he would have been a Lord for that reason. But I'm actually not sure exactly why. So the key thing here is that there are four parts to this definition. So know these. Number one, it's the union of a man and a woman. That's number one. It has to be a man and a woman. Number two, it must be to the exclusion of all others. So that eliminates uh, polygamous marriage. Number three, you must voluntarily enter into it. So you can't be coerced. And to voluntarily do so, you must be of a minimum age. And finally, you must enter into it for life. That doesn't necessarily mean that you can't get a divorce. This, however, prevents people from saying, I'm going to get married for seven years. And at the end of the seven years, uh, I can renew that marriage or we can just leave it. Okay, you can't do that. So they're the four requirements. Uh, remember this as well. This definition was not always in the Marriage Act. This definition originally came from this case in 1866. It was inserted by the Marriage Amendment Act in 2004, in particular to clarify the man and woman bit. Now the reason the Parliament did this, and not just left it as precedent, is that the courts can overturn precedent relatively easily, particularly very old precedent. This is almost 150 years old. In fact, I think it is 150 years old this year. It's very easy to overturn that by saying society has changed its views since then, um, so we're going to get rid of this one man and one woman bit. Uh, the High Court did that with the Marbo cases. You guys remember, they overturned Terra Nullius. What the Parliament did is they said, we're going to put this into statute law. The courts have a very difficult time overturning statute law, particularly recently passed statute law, because they said, well, this is the will of the people. The Parliament was elected. Um, was there a question about that? Yeah. Um, which definition would be more important? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, this one. Marriage Act. That's the current one. It replaced this one. And by replace, I mean it reworded it. Yeah. It's exactly the same words in a different order. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's look at each of those one by one. The union of a man and a woman. That means that two people of the same gender cannot legally be married. This is one of the things that we talk about quite a bit at the moment because the same-sex marriage debate um, is based on the idea that a union is between a man and a woman or between two adults. Um, the key, or one of the key cases in relation to this is Corbett and Corbett. Uh, this involved two, two individuals, a man and a transgendered woman, um, who uh, got married. Um, they, it was then discovered that um, the transgendered woman was originally born as, uh, as a man, um, and they sought a divorce from the court. And Lord Justice uh, Ormrod said, marriage is essentially a relationship between man and woman, and that the respondent is not a woman for the purpose of marriage, but is a biological male and has been so since birth. You don't need to worry about that bit so much. Just know that um, this uh, transgendered woman was considered a man. And so this was a, a marriage between um, two men. Um, Lord Justice Omrod then added, uh, this biological male is not capable of performing the essential role of a woman in marriage. So we've got a question. So so the transgendered woman didn't mm. tell her husband that she was transgendered? Until after they got married. Oh my god. Oh, well that's so stupid. And, and that was a bit of a surprise discovery. Yeah. So um, like, yeah. Now, now the key thing I want you guys to have a look at here is performing the essential role of a woman in marriage. We're looking here at changing so social values. Changing social values. Back then, 
if a woman could not give birth to a child, which someone who was born biologically as a male could not, then uh, you are not you are not capable of entering into a marriage. Okay, that is still talked about today about how marriage is um, for the upbringing of children within the union of a man and a woman, and that comes from this. At the time, that was definitely the view. Today, it's a bit more complicated. Sorry. Um, just with the wording of the the, the case the case naming, why is mm. it the two parties involved? That, does that imply that they're like against each other? Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, so Corbett, uh, I think uh, Corbett wanted the divorce and. Corbett, the spouse, did not. Okay. And so they had to go to court in order to determine whether, whether they could get a divorce. Uh, and the, the judge actually said, you, don't, you cannot get a divorce because you were never married in the first place, so it's not relevant. So he annulled the marriage effectively. Um, and the basis of that is, remember, it's the union of a man and a woman. Yeah. Yeah. So if they were applying for marriage, if it was the issue was about their marriage, it'd be Corbett and R. And um, and the, the surname of the, the spouse who was getting married. So um, the 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 wife in this case took on her husband's surname yeah. when they got married, but the marriage was never legal because it was not between a man and a woman. So it was annulled under this case. Okay, so this um, further emphasized the idea um, that marriage is between a man and a woman that was brought into place by um, the 19, oh, the 1866 Hyde case. Okay, so that was brought into uh, play. In 1866, this further reinforced the idea that it's between a man and a woman in, in 1970, and then further again in 2004 with the Marriage Amendment Act. Okay, so this is something that has not changed since 1866. The next one is to the exclusion of all others. So marriage must be monogamous, in other words, between two people not between one man and four women, or one woman and three men. Okay, it must be between a man and a woman. Um, in Hyde and Hyde and Woodmancy, Lord Penzance stated, it is necessary to define what is meant by marriage in Christendom. So again, you're seeing uh, changing social values. Back then, the idea of Christianity was very strong to the idea of marriage. It means the union of two people who promise to go through life alone with one another. It does not mean the same thing in Utah as the man is at liberty to marry as many people as he pleases. So in this case, the marriage occurred in Utah um, under the, the Mormon faith, um, where, or an off-break of it, where at the time polygamy was allowed. Um, and when they went back to England, they said, no, we don't um, allow polygamous marriage. It must be monogamous. It must be to the exclusion of all others. Okay? Next, voluntarily entered into and for life. So neither partner can be tricked, forced, or coerced into getting married. If this happens, it's not a legal marriage. This can also happen uh, if one of the partners is too young. Um, and finally, a marriage must be entered into with the intention of it being for life. That's the key bit. It must be the intention of for life. And the availability of divorce alone does not prevent this condition from being met. There are also some additional requirements. So that is the definition of marriage, but the Marriage Act also sets out a few additional requirements. And they include one, you must be of marriageable age. So it actually specifies how old you need to be. It tells you how many degrees of relationship you are um, allowed to have. So for example, you can't marry your sibling. It says how much notice you must give. You must have a valid ceremony and you must document it with a certificate. So let's go through those one by one. First of all, you must be of marriageable age. You must be 18, both of you. If you're 16 or older, you can seek special permission for, uh, from a court to get married. They usually only grant permission in exceptional circumstances such as pregnancy or financial dependence and often only if parental consent is given. How does financial dependence? So it might be, for example, that um, a 17-year-old um, a is brought to Australia to marry a 19-year-old who is working and they get married. Um, and the 17 year old, she has no family or friends in Australia, she's dependent on the 19 year old, they'll allow her to get married. Okay, and that does happen with, uh, particularly with cultures where they go back to their home country to find a bride. Um, what's not allowed is this, 10, 12 year old children, they're not allowed to get married legally. You must be at least 16. If one of you is pregnant, if you have parental consent, it makes it a lot easier. Ultimately, it's up to the court. If you're 18, and the other person's 18, you can get married, as long as they're of the opposite sex and you meet all the other requirements. Uh, degrees of relationship. You can't marry a descendant, ancestor, brother, or sister. So siblings are out, children are out, 
parents are out. This applies to half siblings and adopted individuals, but not step parents and stepchildren. Okay? Unless they adopt. So a step parent can adopt a step child. If they do that, ba -ba -um, no marriage will ever be allowed. Notice of marriage, you've got to give one month's notice. You can't get married by Elvis in Las Vegas and have it be a legal marriage. You can't just do it on the fly. You have to give 30 days notice. And if you don't, then it's not a valid marriage. Um, I heard an example, uh, a case of where uh, the marriage celebrant was unavailable for the wedding and they had to get someone else in. Um, I believe that still counted as one month's notice, but it caused some trouble because if you need to give a month's notice, you need to prove that the other celebrant had that month's notice when the second one came along. So you need to give 30 days notice in order to get married. Next, it needs to be a valid ceremony. That means two adults need to witness a ceremony. If you've ever been to a wedding, you will see that they get married, they sign something, and then they get another two people up to also sign as witnesses. Um, and that's a legal requirement. Um, an authorized marriage celebrant must also perform the ceremony, and they must be told 30 days beforehand. If the parties to the marriage reasonably believe this to be the case, the marriage is valid. So if it's not an authorized marriage celebrant, or the people witnessing weren't adults, but you thought they were adults, it's still valid. If they reasonably believed that this was the case. So you're not going to be um, annulled, you're not going to be annulling this marriage if these weren't the case, but you thought they were. Yeah. Are all of these requirements as part of the Marriage Act of 1961? Yeah, these are all in the Marriage Act. So these were in the Marriage Act from 1961. That definition was not inserted into the Marriage Act until 2004. Mm -hmm. However, that was the definition under common law, under Hyde and Hyde and Woodmancy. So that, that was still the definition. The Marriage Act, laws in Australia, they tend to be more um, sort of giving you the framework, the rules of the process. They'll give you the definition, but then they'll say, you need to do this and this and this and this. It's kind of like if you play Monopoly, the aim is to bankrupt everyone else. But then you need the rule book to go through it. So the definition is like what you're trying to do, bankrupt everyone else. Uh, the rule book is all of these requirements that you need to go through. Last requirement, you need a marriage certificate. So you need to document it. This one is uh, Elvis Presley's marriage certificate when he got married to Priscilla Presley. And today people go to Las Vegas and they get married by Elvis impersonators. Okay, so you do need all of those requirements. It's not just meeting the definition of marriage. There are also specific requirements that you must meet in Australia in order to be legally married in Australia. I was going to say you need an Elvis impersonator. No, no, you can get married by an Elvis impersonator as long as they're an authorised marriage celebrant yeah, and you gave them 30 days of notice.